Scott, you got to move that mic to his voice, back and forth. That's really responsive to it. Mark it. 21. Hi. <laughs> well, so what's your strategy now? We're working with uh, this fellow Joe, who I don't know if you got to see him, but um, he's yeah. going to try to get us a record contract. He's going to try to bring people from record companies to see us. Um, I think it's important to make records uh, in order to continue to play music, in order to be able to make money playing music so that we can keep doing it, because it's hard to do something that you don't make money at. You have to do other things to make money. Which It'd be okay attracts if it was enjoyable. That's well, it is sometimes enjoyable, but it, it would be even more enjoyable if we were making money at it and we were able to do it more consistently. And more professionally. Yeah. And it, it would That's be the biggest pain. Enjoyable and or financially reasonable to be doing it. So I think that's our strategy at this point. Once we actually started working together officially, so to speak, with the Millers, um, I wasn't playing so much. I was really sort of acting as a producer and, and, as, and as an overseer. And really, you know, they've been working together, obviously the brothers and, and with Blake, for, for, for a long time. So I was sort of like this new presence in a certain way. I don't know if they actually worked with an outside producer before me, but it was all very natural. I mean, they, it was, they trusted me, and I was really trying to help them, you know, like the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Take what they do, preserve what they do, but try to, try to sort of tighten up certain things and make it better and make it more appealing, you know, you know through, through whatever my uh, prism of what that might have been at that time was. <laughs> What's your memory of them at that time? Oh, you know, the craziness, fun, you know, and a lot of talent. And, and, and four guys, you know, I mean, especially three of them being brothers, but all very different, completely different people. Mike was, was the first Miller that I, you know, became friendly with and worked with. And obviously, uh, Mike was, and he's now Mr. Shy, you know, he's got his whole new persona. He's the new artistic endeavor. And he was shy then and very sort of sensitive and, and uh, obviously would sing in the falsetto a lot of the time. And so, you know, Mike was this sort of, um, as somebody once said, man-child. You know, he sort of had this sort of very um, innocent, and he is, he was. I think he still is in a certain way. Mike, very much into the music, very much into songwriting, obviously into graphics as well, but not so much at that time, as, you know, really focused on writing songs and, and, and music. Um, Blake... Um, obviously into into the bass gelator and making his instrument and a really interesting person not so much the songwriter not so much the way Mike was and a different sense of humor a different sort of um, type of personality much more ironic um, and sort of dry Barney okay I mean talk about like Mike and Barney com, you know like being brothers com, you know it's like Barney is this sort of completely rock and roll guy in a certain way and a totally again a total sense of irony always like a meta person looking at Miller, Miller, Miller and Sloan and kind of like, you know, oh yeah, it's a crazy Miller thing, whatever. You know, it's like it's just constant commentary on their, on their zaniness in a certain way. But a really creative, great songwriter, all of these, you know, and a completely different songwriting style than Mike's. You know, Mike at that time, especially when I was working with them, was very much into the sort of cool 1980s, sort of late 80s style, a lot, you know, influenced by like Babyface and those types of things. And then there's Dan. Uh, who's like completely different from m maybe closer to Blake because they ended up working together uh, on other projects and software and technology and things like that. But Dan was involved in software at that time. Dan was involved in digital audio in the late 80s, recording digital audio onto videotape at CD quality. Um, and he was working with Dr. T and developing sequencing software, you know, workstation music software. This is all part of uh, the sequencer package which we used to record. And a really, obviously a really intelligent guy, very sort of, you know, cuts to the heart of the matter. Um, completely different personalities. I mean, it was sort of like when they were together, you're sort of like, you're almost surprised in a way. <laughs> if the guys were thinking that, that they didn't find their niche, I mean, there may be something to that. That period in the 80s was a very slick time. Grunge hadn't happened yet. Um, in a certain way, they were kind of walking a fine line between being this sort of garage band, uh, but at the same time wanting to be viable in a marketplace that, all of this, that had all of this very slick music going on as well. So it was a bit of a tightrope.
played a tape for a friend of mine like, a few days ago. He said, "Oh, so you're doing that modern pop dance music? That that's what he called it." It's modern pop dance. Yeah, it's very Mod electronic now. Uh, although the sounds are organic, we reproduce them electronically. What about the you know, way you make songs? How has that changed? The creation process. Honestly, it's it's not it's not really a, uh, in terms of songwriting. We're not a, a, a really a it's not a team effort anymore. As much. It's really no, no, it is. I mean, it never really was that much. There were only a few songs. It's now more like someone will write a tune, they'll make a demo of it, mm -hmm. and then and then the, the band tries to imitate right. the demo. Yeah. I won't. Which is actually the, what the what most bands do once they get into. A, see, the thing is, like back in the sixties and seventies. Bands couldn't make really couldn't make really polished demos because of MIDI, which we won't bother mentioning, and stuff like that. Uh, no, but this is true. I mean, uh, this is changing all bands. It's easier and for then one when you watch to put a sound. nowadays, when you watch like MTV, you'll see a band. You say, "Oh, that's a good band." It's not a band. It's a guy named Joe. He hires <laughs> singer Bob, drummer Sterling, not, and all these people. Mm -hmm. No, that is totally true. With with 50, 60 percent of the bands that you see on MTV, they're not real bands. One thing is that even though. Our creation process is very similar to that. We still are a real band. They were a real band. They were a real band. I mean, that's the interesting thing, is that, is that bands, you look at certain bands that have been around for decades, they do different things. You know, they make different types of records, they experiment with different technologies, uh, but hopefully they, they stay intrinsically who they are. And I think even though you can look at Funky Family, 1980? Funky. You can you can you can look at that and it's totally real and it's totally like you know late seventies early it's like so prototypical you know eighties early eighties funk um, real people just because they moved on and started using drum machines and started incorporating synthesizers into what they were doing to me they were still those it was still that ethos it was still that band it was still that sense of humor. Oh, there's some good music out there. There's also a lot of music that, that doesn't that's good professionally What's done and, and, and proficient but sometimes doesn't feel like the people were having any fun yeah. and I think people miss that in music that was something that was definitely there when I was like really young when I was 10 or 11 and listening to stuff in the 60s that was always an aspect of music you know no, no matter how out of tune people were singing or how badly the recording was done it always sounded like there was a lot of energy behind it and I, I we try to keep an element of that while still sort of uh, bringing, you know, making our music Is somewhat up to date. I do remember the, the sort of tug of war that would sort of happen in terms of, of also not, also being concerned about it not getting too slick. But if I have any sort of recollection of like, you know, was that I think it needs to be tighter and they might have been like, you know, let's have fun and let's not make it, you know. Yeah, that time Dan was critical about a lot of bands that they didn't look, look like they were having fun. On yes. Stage. Yes, but they weren't. A lot of bands weren't having fun on stage in, in, the, in the mid and late 80s. There, there were a lot of sequence tracks. There, people were really getting used to. It wasn't a rock and roll ethos. There's a feeling to it. There was, a lot you know, of the funk stuff that we 70s. listened to. No, the, the early 70s, 70s had with a lot of crazy. music. And, and it's yeah. all psychological. Like right now, the big thing is like Mo, the Motown sound because everything is 20 years because people are now reminiscing about that. And it's, it's just because that's what they were brought up with. I mean, you know, in the future, people are going to be reminiscing. Me, but... People are going to be reminiscing about the music <laughs> made now. But I can't think of anybody that was like a garage band in the way that the Millers were, uh, in the good sense, that broke out at that time. I think music was slicker than that. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe they would have happened in, you know, in 1968 kind of thing. You know, maybe they were more like uh, the Kingsmen, like, you know, Louie Louie. Maybe they were more like that, men, that ethos, even though the music was totally different. When you ask the question, why didn't it happen, the, the issue of the gatekeepers always second-guessing themselves, and instead of looking maybe at this wonderful, you know, sort of organically evolved Miller, 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 and Sloan and saying, there's a lot of great stuff here, let's see how we can figure this out, I think that there might have been more of a situation of maybe having fear and going, we don't know anybody that's really like this. So without a, without a precedent, it becomes difficult sometimes for an executive to actually put their, their reputation and their career and, and everything on the line. But meanwhile, they'll be the first one to tell you that they're looking for something new. So 